the Bolsheviks were in power in Russia, um, we left off with that piece uh, of the October Revolution here where the Red Guard overthrows the provisional government. After this, uh, a civil war ensues, and it starts with uh, or directly after the new Bolshevik government under Trotsky and Lenin decide that they're going to exit World War One. This had always been a demand of the socialists, uh, and they finally were able to do this now that they were in power in the seat of government in St. Petersburg. Um, so this is the treaty here. Uh, this is an image of it. Uh, and, and they were sort of out of options anyway with, with what was going on in the capital. The German and Austrian forces were on their way in anyway. And um, so officially, this was the treaty that officially ended the war for the Russians. Um, so they were out of the alliance. They were in the Triple Entente with France and Britain, uh, which angers them, which we're going to get back to in a second. But it also, uh, again, changes changes what's going on in Russia. No longer are they in World War I. This breaks out into a uh, civil war within Russia. So all of the forces that were in favor of the monarchy or what the Russians were doing of World War I, obviously, uh, by their very nature, were opposed to the Bolsheviks. And um, the Bolsheviks, as, as I said, had this Red Guard. Uh, they turned this into the Red Army. Uh, Trotsky's going to do this. And I'll talk about this in the next slide. But, and they're really against sort of a, a combination of everyone else. Um, and so in my little slide here, I said militarists, monarchists, the existing bureaucracy, foreign powers. We're going to get into more detail about that later. Um, but that's going to be the, the coalition that's going to try to take Russia back from the Bolsheviks after the February Revolution in 1917. So as I said, Trotsky sort of transforms his Red Guard into uh, an, a Red Army, the Workers and Peasants Red Army. The first thing he does, obviously, to grow his army is to draft particularly peasants, but anyone really, into the army. Um, and he does this by offering uh, bread to soldiers and land to peasants. Uh, so a, a revolutionary uh, sort of armed coup turns into a, an all-out military um, ready to hold down power now that they've acquired it. Uh, and they're going to be against uh, the quote-unquote white army, which they're going to come to uh, come to be called. Uh, and it's, t it's sort of tough to... to gather all these things. It's actually going to take me two slides to get through all of the groups that were part of this white army. So inside Russia, it's th you know things like your, your military generals that fought during World War I that are against the Bolsheviks, people who want the monarchy back. At this point, Nicholas II is under house arrest somewhere in Siberia. Uh, landowners who are worried about what's going to happen to their land, conservatives who obviously don't want to go towards socialism, and even liberals who are looking more for more towards a, a democracy or some kind of constitutional democracy in favor of socialism. Uh, so those people will, will, will go against the Bolsheviks, um, but also ethnic groups uh, and, and uh, states around the periphery of mainland Russia, like Finland, Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, uh, Siberia, they all sort of see this revolution as a, as a way to gain independence and get away from uh, that government, uh, be able to create their own, some that don't want to be socialists or some that don't want to be associated with the Bolsheviks. When you add the uh, foreign involvement to that group, the whites seem like a pretty substantial army. Uh, the Germans still want to continue uh, to fight the Bolsheviks because they're afraid that communism could spread. Um, the Japanese are uh, a little wary about what's going on uh, in, uh, in their northern border, and they're very against communism, and they want to sort of distance themselves from Russia, and they see this chance to do that. France and England uh, and the uh, Allied powers in general want to maintain the eastern front that was giving Germany a really hard time, and they're angry about the Soviet withdrawal from the war because of that. And so they want to reestablish that front, and they also are worried that when the Soviets take over, that they won't pay the Russian imperial debt that had been acquired at the beginning of World War I. Uh, and then as part of sort of that allied movement, even the United States and, and Canada send troops this way um, to make sure that either uh, Germany doesn't get uh, an easier go in World War I, they don't get to take Russian... Um, resources and military resources both uh, and sort of turn it around and use it against the Allies, uh, but also to try to establish another front to make it harder for Germany to, to win World War One. So the course of battle, I, I show this image again to show you sort of how little 
the Bolsheviks really controlled, obviously they controlled the capital, which is now Petrograd uh, and Moscow. And, and from there on out, you know, some of this territory is red. But what's hap what happens is, is early on in the war, uh, while the Red uh, Guard is turning into the Red Army and Trotsky is trying to recruit people, um, the whites really sort of constrain the Red territory. Um, and as they're approaching Moscow and, and they're sort of uh, tightening their stranglehold on the Reds here, Unfortunately for the whites in their in their campaign, uh, World War One ends and the Treaty of Versailles is signed. And when it is, a lot of the powers, the foreign powers that we were just looking at, that were helping the whites, um, actually now have to leave. Um, and even sort of the British sort of think about trying to stay involved in that, but with uh, the lack of leadership of the whites and, and some atrocities that they were committing, they really couldn't commit themselves to. To continuing this struggle, uh, especially in the wake of, of World War One, which is a very costly war, um, and then sort of this final point on this slide about it down here is that they lack cohesiveness. That ultimately, even when they were sort of pinching uh, the red uh, territory here, uh, there wasn't one overall commander, and there was no one that could say uh, sort of organize these all of these different groups that we just looked at and, and help them sort of. Uh, achieve a military victory and so the Reds kind of held on um, and here's how they did that number one is is when it when they're struggling Lenin decides to order the imperial family executed um, so that the whites have less of a sort of rallying cry or something that they're fighting for because Nicholas and his family are dead um, but he also makes this decision to to he says you know very clearly that food in Russia during these tough times will go to Soldiers first, and then you know individual citizens and, and to the people who are living in the cities second, um, so that it sort of encourages people. Okay, I'll enlist in the army so that I can uh, sustain myself, make a little money, whatever. Uh, and that this sort of grows his army, makes sure that he keeps an army in the field. And also Trotsky's pretty good as a military advisor, though he has no military experience. His is a very simple policy: if generals are winning battles, they're promoted, and if they're not, they're paying to have heavy price. Um, and, and that seems to, to work out okay uh, for the sake of this war. And then obviously, as I was just saying, in 1918, uh, the Allies evacuate Russia and, and really all of the powers involved in World War I start to withdraw from this cause. And it becomes really just a Russian Soviet versus everyone else, sort of red versus white uh, fight. And, and actually then right after that, sort of the, the Red Army starts to get some victories in Siberia and the, West, and the um, East. And then they turn their attention to the West when uh, Poland actually sort of renews the fighting and pushes their border, um, their eastern border, into the Soviet Union. Uh, and, and right after they had sort of gained their independence, they, they want to, as I said, define that eastern border. And so they launch this invasion and sort of then Russia's, uh, the Red Army sort of focuses on fighting them back. And they launch a successful counterattack that really pushes all the way back towards Warsaw. Um, and then there's, you know, a counterattack back against the Russians, and kind of goes back and forth, and, and at, you know, at which point Lenin kind of says, uh, we're, we're done with war. Uh, and he makes this treaty, the Treaty of Riga here, um, which ends up giving Poland, or defining, defining Poland's boundaries and putting these two powers at peace, and then once this, this western border of the Soviet Union is defined, and as I said, they had success militarily in the east, uh, this marks the birth um, of the USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, um, that was after their victory. And uh, formerly the Russian Socialist Federative Soviet Republic uh, is in charge, and com the Communist Party starts to consolidate power. Uh, and then, you know, obviously Lenin has to work through disbanding the, the army uh, and bringing it into this bureaucratic structure, which it still is a bureaucracy at this point point there is still class uh, even though the goal of the communism is obviously to get rid of that and then he has to go through on his promises to, to nationalize land get land to the people who fought for him and the peasants um, to employ the laborers and make sure that they're living comfortably etc 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 so economically it's it's time to fix um, the, the all of the problems that had been brought on before World War one World War one and now the Civil War um, and this is sort of what I'll leave you with which is a quotation from Lenin where he sort of addresses this he says the specific feature of the present situation in Russia is that the country is passing from the first stage of the revolution, which, owing to the insufficient class consciousness and organization of the proletariat, 
placed power in the hands of the bourgeoisie to its second stage, which must place power in the hands of the proletariat and the poorest section of the peasant. So that's obviously the goal for Lenin is to get rid of class, and you know, as we as we read in, in Marx, um, and although in, you know, as he says, in the first stages the bourgeoisie did, does take control. Um, that moving forward, uh, he's going to sort of really uh, strengthen the hold of of the communist party and uh, ideology in Russia. That's where we'll pick up when we get back to class, talking about Lenin and Trotsky, and then obviously uh, the introduction of Stalin to it, and that'll be our topic for Class Tuesday. Thank you.